Okay, so today I want to talk about one of the key theorems of probability, and this is called the central limit theorem. And it kind of builds on all the stuff we've been talking about over the past few lessons. Okay, and this is a really cool uh, idea. Basically, it's saying that the sum of a bunch of random variables eventually looks Gaussian. And so let me kind of explain that more precisely. Okay, so from before, we talked about the sum and the mean of a bunch of random variables. Okay, and so if all of these xi's are iid and they have mean mu and variance sigma squared, right, we showed that the expected value of the sum was n times mu and the variance of the sum was n sigma squared. And if we define the mean as the average of these random variables, we showed that the expected value of the mean was mu, and the variance of the mean was 1 over n sigma squared. Okay, so all this is old news, right? What I want to talk about today is really focusing on not just the expected value and the variance, but what does the limit of the whole PDF, the whole distribution of this random variable look like. And that's what the central theorem is all about. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a new variable z that is basically related to, it's kind of like a, a, you know, a certain kind of mean. It's like the sum of the random variables normalized in a certain way. Okay, remember this is the sum of all the random variables. So what are the expected value and variance of, of z, right? So I can see that the expected value is going to be, you know, the expected value of the sum minus n mu, and this is n mu, right? So this is going to be 0. And also the variance of this z is going to be um, 1 over this thing squared times the variance of the sum, which again, this thing is n sigma squared, so this is equal to 1. So basically what I found out was that at each n, so for, for any n, this special normalization is 0 mean unit variance. Okay. So the super cool thing the central limit theorem tells us is that in the limit, this thing is Gaussian, right? So what do I mean by that? So the central limit theorem also sometimes CLT says that the limit as I take more and more um, numbers, this is basically like the CDF of Z, right? And the central limit theorem says, then the limit, this is the CDF, right? Writing it in a slightly different way, it's like saying that in the limit, the CDF of Z is equal to the CDF of kind of what we called our normal or our standard Gaussian. Right, so this would be like 1 minus the Q function at whatever this number is, right? So that's really interesting, I think. That's like saying that the CDF of this normalized sum of random variables, no matter what the distribution of random variable is, eventually converges to a Gaussian, okay? The proof of this is a little bit advanced, and it uses these characteristic functions that I said I wasn't going to talk a lot about, these Fourier transforms and so on. So you're just going to kind of take it on faith. Now, the really cool thing about this is that, you know, the CDF of each of these random variables individually could look really weird, right? So for example, uh, Bernoulli CDF for each one looks like basically a step function or uh, a binomial random variable has kind of like this stepwise. Or I could have some sort of uh, weird CDF that kind of takes its weird time monotonically getting to one. Or I could have some sort of a bizarro 
mixed random variable that takes some steps and then has some continuous parts and then takes another step and so on, right? No matter what the underlying PDF is, eventually the CDF of this normalized sum goes to Gaussian. And I think that, you know, the easiest way to see this is with a numerical example. Um, and so luckily there's this great applet that I found. And so here you can see the address of it up here and the author of it uh, over here, right? And let me just kind of show you what this means, right? So here we have a uniform distribution. One, so here what we're doing is we're saying, give me 10,000 samples of uniform distribution. Show me the distribution. Well, it looks like basically uniform, right? This is kind of what these laws of lumber, large numbers tell us is that in the limit, if I take a whole bunch of samples, the sample PDF should look like the underlying PDF. Now what happens if I add two uniform random variables together? Now, the sum of those things looks kind of triangular, right? I'm more likely to get values in the middle. What happens if I add five of those things together? Now things are looking like that kind of bell curve, and that's what, we, that's what we're talking about with the center limb there. And we're saying that basically in the limit, the CDF becomes Gaussian, which means the PDF looks like the bell curve. And after I add, say, nine of these together, then adding up, you know, 2,500 examples, I get things that look like the bell curve. The more samples I use, the more this thing looks like the bell curve. And this is true for any distribution. So here's a kind of a weirdo distribution where the PDF looks like kind of, you know, a uh, straight line. And I'm gonna use a smaller number of samples here. If I add two of those numbers up, I get something that is kind of more biased towards big values, but starts to look like this kind of humped Gaussian. Add five of those together, I get something that looks already pretty Gaussian. Add nine of those together and do enough of them, and eventually I'll get something that already looks like basically Gaussian. So it's not like I have to add 10,000 random variables together to get this Gaussian look. Really, in real world examples, I only have to add up like five or nine of them, right? So here's another example with a weird PDF that is kind of like a stair-steppy function, right? Again, I'm just gonna add up, you know, seven of those things, and already that stair-steppy stuff kind of goes away. Here's an example where the uh, you know thing kind of looks like very unlikely to get a middle value and very high likelihood to get kind of extreme values. Again, if I sum up those two things, it doesn't take long before I start to get more mass in the middle, and then it doesn't take much longer before those kinds of like dips in the middle kind of even out. Um, and so again, here I am Gaussian again. Um, and so the same thing is true. Here's like a kind of a version that's more like an exponential random variable, right? Lots of high probability at the low end, very low probability of getting big numbers. If I sum up two of those numbers, you know, I start to kind of push the probability of mass over towards the center. Um, and if I add up four of those, you know, things, I still have kind of a long tail. If I add up like nine of those, then, you know, I start to get a pretty Gaussian looking thing again, right? So again, this is kind of a fun applet to play with and hopefully it convinces you that number one, it doesn't take very long for things to start looking Gaussian as I add them up. And number two, this really motivates like why we cared about the Gaussian so much in the first place because in the limit, in some sense, everything eventually becomes Gaussian, right? And that means that in the next couple of lessons, I'm gonna go back to using these Q tables to be able to estimate probabilities that involve sums of random numbers. And I can be pretty sure that those estimated probabilities are gonna be accurate because I know that things look Gaussian in the limit. So stay tuned for a few sequences of lessons where we talk about using Q tables to estimate probabilities.